Hey team, Andre from High Performance Academy. Welcome to another one of our webinars. And in this webinar, we're going to be diving into cam control on the Haltech Elite 2500 ECU. Uh, to demonstrate this, we're going to be using our Mitsubishi Lancer Evo 9, which has a 4G63 with MyVec, which essentially means continuously variable cam control on the intake cam only. Now obviously we see continuously variable cam control applied to a range of different engines. Uh, quite often it will be only on the intake cam. Generally if we've got variable cam control we find that from a performance standpoint we see larger gains from changing the cam timing on the inlet cam versus changing the cam timing on the exhaust cam. So uh, for cheaper variants of cam control engines we will generally see that it's only applied to the intake cam. Uh, of course uh, in all out applications it will be applied to both the process for setting it up and tuning it is very similar uh, a few more iterations to your process though when you're dealing with both intake and exhaust cam control so what are we trying to do with cam control well if we actually rewind a little bit and look at the uh, older days before continuously variable cam control was introduced uh, the option for the tuner was to fit vernier adjustable cam gears to a conventional camshaft and what that allowed us to do is uh, very accurately move the cam timing uh, relative to the crankshaft timing so basically we could advance or retard the camshaft which basically means that we are opening and closing the intake and exhaust valves either earlier in the engine cycle or later and this is kind of one of those situations where there's no free lunches the general trend and yes there are nuances to this but the general trend is that if we advance the cam timing so again opening and closing the valves earlier in the engine cycle this tends to favor cylinder fill at lower rpm where the air has less airspeed and less inertia so what this means in simple terms is that by advancing the cam timing we tend to make more power and torque at lower rpm but of course this is at the sacrifice of power and torque at higher rpm and you can probably join the dots at this point and guess that if advancing the cam timing favors low rpm performance retarding the cam timing which of course is opening and closing the valves later in the engine cycle tends to favor high rpm performance so with old vernier adjustable cam gears and fixed cam timing it was really a case of making the best compromise to move that power and torque curve around to suit our own preferences and application but really once it was set on the dyno that was it we can't adjust it so then manufacturers sort of saw the benefit and be able to adjust the cam timing while the engine was operating and hence we have variable cam control and this allows the ECU to advance and retard the cam timing very very quickly using hydraulic pressure from the engine oil while the engine's running meaning that we can map the cam timing to get our supposed optimal cam timing throughout the rev and load range we'll generally have a 3D map which we're going to have a look at in a moment. Now I just also want to clear up that this is different to switched cam control okay uh, there is a lot of confusion out there and there's engines such as Honda's VTEC engines which switches cam lobes from a small cam lobe that's optimized for low RPM performance to a larger cam lobe offering more lift and duration which is optimized for high RPM performance so that is what I call switched cams uh, the other element is some engines such as let's say Toyota's 20 valve 4AGE uh, some of Nissan's SR and RB engines used another mode of switch cam timing so in this case different to VTEC they're still only operating one, one cam lobe per uh, valve but what they have is a mechanism where they can advance and retard the cam timing but not continuously meaning that they only have either an advanced or a retarded position it might be 15 degrees difference between the two and we can only operate in one or the other and that was kind of a compromise in between uh, fixed cam timing and full continuous so again to be clear continuous valve timing or continuous van valve uh, cam control I should say uh, means that we can advance and retard the cam timing and actually target a specific cam angle throughout the engine operator I know that's all uh, a bit of a mouthful and quite complex if you haven't come across this again as we move through and look at a live demonstration here on the dyno this is all going to make uh, a lot more sense so for a start what do we need for cam control 
Well, with very few exceptions, this isn't something that you're going to be able to add to a conventional engine that didn't come with it. And the reason for this is it requires quite a lot of specific elements for it to work. Uh, first of all, there is the cam pulley itself, or actuator, or phaser as, it, as it's often called. And uh, this requires a special mechanism with basically internal lobes and uh, oil galleries that can pressurize either side of the lobes to advance or retard the cam. Uh, it also require a trigger mode so that the ECU not only knows what the engine RPM is and the engine position but it also needs a bit more resolution around what the actual cam position is so it can decode that and it knows what the cam timing is so really uh, with again very very few exceptions and I know someone will pipe up with the fact that HKS offer uh, the VCAM conversion for the RB26 yes for every rule there is an exception but for the for most cases basically we are only going to be dealing with this with a uh, a supported factory cam control engine and by supported I also mean that generally your ECU that you're using is going to need a trigger mode that is designed for variable cam control or cam control in general uh, for your engine so that basically covers most of the popular engines including uh, our 4G63 of course uh, so let's jump into the Haltech NSP software and we'll have a quick look through and basically work through this and I'm going to go through the process of setting up cam control and actually tuning it because this is where a lot of people really don't understand uh, the proportional integral and derivative gains or PID gains the effect on the cam control accuracy and operation uh, and that's just the basic setup basically making sure that the cam control can track the target that we're looking for once we've got it actually doing its job and functioning as it should then we've also got the task of tuning it so those are the elements that we're going to be covering off uh, as usual we will have questions and answers on this topic so if you've got anything that I talk about that you want me to explain in more detail or anything related to this specific topic please ask them in the chat we'll get to those at the end so we're in the NSP software here and for a start what I want to point out is I've actually made up a separate page here for cam control and if you've got a fresh installation uh, of the NSP software that's not necessarily going to be the case but what you can do is click here on add new page or control plus shift n and then you can select a page to add uh, so in this case cam control pretty self-explanatory there I'm not going to do it again uh, or you can make your own page no big deal there so we'll come across to cam control the nice aspect of, of this is it's kind of predefined to basically give us all of the information that we're going to need at a glance uh, now because the uh, the 4G63 MyVec engine only has continuously variable cam control on the intake, uh, some of this is redundant. So for example, up here, we've got a real-time trace of our cam position versus our target. Uh, and we've got the same down here for our non-existent exhaust cam. So you know, obviously if you've got uh, a dual variable cam control engine, both of these are going to be doing some work. Uh, we've got a little warning here for our wideband O2, which is not relevant to our demonstration simply it isn't uh, plugged in or isn't working on our installation at the moment uh, over here we've got some more information which basically mirrors what we've got in the graph we've got our cam target sitting at zero and our cam angle one which you can see just moving around very very slightly uh, but pretty much sitting on our target so then over in uh, the left hand side here uh, we've got the uh, functionality that we want to go over and talk about. So um, let's actually start with our engine configuration and our trigger system. This would need to be set up before we got started but basically uh, we have here our trigger type which is our Mitsubishi 4G63 Alance Evolution 9, bit of a mouthful. The key point here is that this trigger system is key to uh, the cam control as I mentioned it gives the ECU the information it needs to know about the actual cam position as opposed to just getting one input every engine cycle so that it knows whereabouts in the engine cycle it is a little bit more involved with this uh, a little bit more information that we can fill in here but essentially this is preset for the 4G63 so it uh, shouldn't actually need a lot of uh, changes being made uh, the rest of it comes down to our engine functions and we come down 
down here to our cam control of course which I've already got uh, expanded out. We've got intake and we've got exhaust which again doesn't exist here. So uh, let's have a look through this and each time I click on one of these obviously it pops up in our cam control uh, worksheet here or page. Uh, we've got our target angle so this is simply a three-dimensional table uh, we've got our rpm on our vertical axis and we've got our manifold pressure or fuel load as it's actually called here uh, on our horizontal axis so this is just a three-dimensional table of rpm versus load and the numbers in this table here are our cam targets this is what we're actually asking for this is simply the uh, predefined or base map i should say for the 4g63 evo 9 not actually a bad place to get started as it turns out. There are also some reasonably common trends that we will see when we're looking at cam targets, uh, particularly if we're talking about our intake cam here. What we generally tend to see is that the cam timing will advance up to or close to its maximum. Uh, which is when I say maximum, obviously there is a mechanical limit to how much advance and retard uh, the cam has. Uh, in this case, I, I think we work out to about 35 degrees, maybe a little bit less. We'll actually go through and find that out. Uh, engines like Honda's K20 actually have about 50 degrees of movement, so it's very dependent on the manufacturer. But generally we'll find that the trend will be that at lowish RPM, so around about peak torque, uh, we'll see that the cam timing will advance up close to its maximum, which in this case we can see the numbers in this base map, sort of around about 35 degrees from 2,500 RPM up to about 4,000 RPM. And then as we move up in the RPM, we see that our numbers retard back to generally add or very close to the most retarded value, uh, which in this case we can see is zero. So this is always something that I'll kind of look at as a bit of a sanity check. Do the numbers make sense? Is the pattern what I would expect and this is the sort of pattern we should be looking for. Generally around about maximum advance or pretty close to uh, down low in the RPM sort of two and a half to three and a half thousand RPM before gradually tapering back to maximum retard by our red line that's probably going to be pretty close. Uh, now another element with this is uh, in terms of how we go about tuning it, which again we'll have a live demonstration, but um, this really is one of those elements that I do not believe that you can do a good job of without a quality uh, load bearing dyno like our mainline Pro Hub, just to name one of the, the brands that will do the job. We need something that's sensitive, this is not something that you are going to be able to do a quality job of out on the road, and uh, if you are road tuning, honestly you're probably as well to leave the base map at least in this case of the Mitsubishi Evo 9 and call it good uh, I've already found that it is actually pretty close to the mark so we're only talking about uh, you know sort of uh, rounding errors essentially in terms of the gains that you're likely to get at least in stock form all bets are off once you start modifying the engine and go to aftermarket camps all right so let's look at the process we've actually got at the moment the engine sitting here idling and we've got a, a system that's already set up and working but uh how do you go about doing this well there's a few things that we need to understand first and we need to have a, a chat about PID and what that means. So if we look over here on the left hand side, we can see we've got three selections here, three parameters, proportional gain, integral gain and derivative gain. And these really come up in just about any element with our ECU tuning which involves closed loop control. And closed loop control simply means that we're controlling an output in order to achieve a target. So this could be cam control, obviously in this case uh, with cam control we're controlling an actuator uh, that's operating at probably two to 300 hertz uh, that is controlling the oil flow to our cam phaser in order to advance or retard the cam timing until it matches our target. But uh, this closed loop control equally would work for boost control, basically where we have a target boost pressure and the ECU is manipulating the duty cycle sent to a boost control solenoid in order to get to our target. Idle speed, another perfect example. So this is something that actually comes up repeatedly with ECU tuning, but I think uh, in general this is probably one of the least understood topics and really a lot of tuners, I would say the majority of tuners don't know how to approach uh, control uh, tuning a PID algorithm and if you don't get this right, 
uh, basically you're going to be starting behind the eight ball and you're going to struggle getting good control of your cam timing your boost control or anything else that you're trying to tune so really this is the the place that we need to focus on uh, and before we dive into this because I know these terms one of the problems with them is they don't really mean anything to most people uh, particularly if you don't have a intricate understanding of PID control algorithms and how they function they're meaningless terms so I always think it's better if we can get a, a sense of what these terms mean in the real world so I'm going to use uh, a little analogy that I'm stealing from MoTeC it's actually in our boost control course as well as our cam control tuning course but this breaks down how those P, I and D elements actually work so let's say we're sitting on a straight piece of road in a car and 100 meters ahead of us we've got a set of traffic lights and our aim is to accelerate the car up to the set of traffic lights and stop at the traffic lights uh, as quickly as we can so for a start let's just say that the only control we've got available to us is the accelerator and this is likened to the proportional gain element the proportional gain means that the effect it has is proportional to the size of the error. Now, let's just understand what that means. Uh, if we're sitting in our car and we're 100 meters away from our target, then obviously that error is very large. So the proportional gain will have a larger effect. As we get closer to the target, the error is reducing, so the effect of the proportional gain is reduced. Now, obviously, just thinking about the physics behind this, if we are only able to use the throttle, we're going to have a problem. Sure, we can use a little bit of throttle, and we're going to slowly creep up to our traffic light, and we're going to be able to ease off the throttle and come to a rolling stop at the right point, but it's going to take a long time. Obviously, we can use a lot more throttle. It will accelerate us up to that line quickly, but we don't have a break at this point. We've only got the throttle, so of course, what we're going to end up doing is going overshooting, and we're going to go past our target, and then we're going to have to select reverse, we're going to do the same thing, we're going to overshoot, and we're going to oscillate backwards and forwards around our target. Okay, so that's what the proportional gain on its own is like. Let's now add the next obvious element, which is the brake pedal, the ability to actually use the brakes. And this is like our derivative gain. The derivative gain works based on the rate of change of error so when the error is changing very rapidly the derivative gain will have a larger effect and it is a braking effect so now we could probably understand that we're going to use a lot be able to use a lot more throttle to get up to our target quickly and then the brake pedal can be used to slow us down and make sure that we don't overshoot the integral gain is a little bit harder to explain using this analogy. This is uh, a element that works over time. Basically, if we just look at the proportional gain on its own and the derivative gain on its own, those two elements together are, will never actually be able to get us right onto our target. And the reason for this is if we consider the proportional gain, I said that it is uh, relative to the size of the error. So once we get really, really close to our target, let's say boost control for example, we're targeting 15 PSI and we're at 5 PSI. Big error, big effect with our proportional gain to drive us towards our target. Once we get really close down to maybe 1 PSI or half a PSI, the error is really small so the proportional gain has less and less effect and it won't drive us to the point where that error is zero. So the integral gain looks at that error over time and lets us just move slowly but surely onto the target. So I liken this to essentially now looking at our example, uh, our traffic light on our straight piece of road. Now let's consider that the traffic light's actually on a hill. Uh, so the integral gain is likened to being able to use the handbrake to actually hold us at our target position. So that's just a little real world analogy before we dive into it. Let's jump into the laptop software for a moment. And the first place we actually want to start is by uh, zeroing out our gains. So the reason for this is when we zero out our P, I and our D gains, this actually means that the ECU will not perform any closed loop control. Uh, this puts us into essentially what's normally referred to as open loop. So let's have a look at what we've got here. I've gone to the proportional gain and we have a two dimensional table relative to our coolant temperature. You might be thinking, well, why do we need uh, a two dimensional table? Why can't we have just one number? Well, we can, but remember that this system is actuated via oil pressure. Now, 
while oil pressure isn't directly correlated to coolant temperature, there is obviously a correlation in there somewhere. And in most instances, we may not by default have an oil temperature sensor. So coolant temperature is the default value or default parameter for this uh, parameter. Um, and for the for this gain, I should say. And if you do have oil temperature, you can measure it directly. We'll simply change it so it is oil temperature. The reason for this is the viscosity of the oil changes with temperature. Um, uh, and with the viscosity change, so does the functionality or the effectiveness of our cam control. Basically, uh, long and short of it is that the control strategy may quite likely need to be different uh, when it's stone cold uh, and compared to what it will be at operating temperature. So that's why we've got that. What I'm going to do, seeing as we are at operating temperature here, all I'm going to do is just zero out the 80 degree column and obviously that will affect anything 80 degrees and above our coolant temperature at the moment sitting at uh, just on 90 degrees. Okay, so proportional gain zeroed. Let's now go ahead and do exactly the same for our uh, integral gain and then finally our derivative gain. Alright, so all of those are zeroed out default values in this table from our base map give you a bit of a sense of maybe where those numbers might need to be but uh, base maps are only for the purpose of getting the car up and running and we can't take these as gospel so we always want to uh, confirm and optimize these values to suit our own uh, requirements okay so we've got those zeroed so again we're in open loop mode now the first part that we're actually going to try tuning here if we come up here we want to come to our intake one uh, base duty cycle so We've got this little solenoid that is sitting there pulsing away at sort of two to three hundred hertz and uh, this is just like a boost control solenoid although this is supplying oil to our cam phaser and what we want to do is basically find the neutral point uh, we can't tune uh, cam control in the clo in O, but we want to find the point the duty cycle required to actually start advancing and retarding uh, the cam control so what we're going to do here uh, we can see that we've got numbers of 81 percent in here at the moment let's just start by zeroing these out i kind of know where we want to be we're going to bring the rpm up to uh, maybe sort of 2000 rpm we want to get to a point where we're off idle we've got basically good realistic oil control uh, and what we can see here on our graph the green line is our target so Let's just see why that's moved. We'll come back to our target angle. We can see that we're now interpolating between zero and 10 degrees. Just to remove any confusion, let's just zero that out. We'll see our green line comes back. Okay, let's come back to our base duty cycle. So we can see our red line, which is our target, that, uh, sorry, our measured cam angle, that's sitting at zero. So what we wanna do basically is adjust these numbers here in our base duty cycle and find the point where our cam timing actually just starts to move. So what we'd generally do if we know nothing about this is we'd start at 10%, 20% and just basically jump this up in 10% increments. Oh, I know where it's going to start moving so I'm going to cheat a little bit here. Whoops. Let's just bring that back down. I got the wrong number in there. So we need to basically have our RPM up to a point where everything is going to move around. Uh, so let's go up to 50% here. Still no movement in our graph to the right, 60%. Still no movement, 70%, 80%, and 90%. Okay, so 90%, we see that red line jump straight up. So of course it's going to go straight to its maximum, which is a perfect time to actually see that our maximum value on the mechanical stop is 29.7 degrees. Let's call it 30 degrees. That's important, and we'll come back to why that's important shortly. But um, basically 90% 90, 90 it moved, 80% will come back down and you can start to see it's drifting down slowly. So let's just try page up here. Okay, 81% it's flatlined. Again, I'll just bring it back the RPM up a little bit. 82, it's increasing. 81, it's staying flat. 80% it comes down. Okay, 81% that seems to be uh, our neutral position there where uh, if I go above 81% it's going to start advancing the cam timing, if I go below 81% it brings it back down. Okay so again we've got a two dimensional table here relative to coolant temperature, again we've got that correlation be between coolant temperature and oil temperature. So we would want to do this at cold start, we'd want to do this at operating temperature and then generally I wouldn't necessarily tune every single cell, uh, a horizontal interpolation between those, those numbers once 
once you've got good data uh, should be sufficient. So that's our first point. We've, t we've now tuned that. We've found that position where the cam timing will just start to change and that is 81%. Interestingly, that's quite high. Normally, I would expect that to be about 50%, not always, but probably between 40 and 60, but at the end of the day, we give the engine what it wants. Okay, so that's an important point to start with because it's a little bit like, let's say, closed loop boost control. And one of the problems that I see or mistakes that I see people make with closed loop boost control is not really worrying about setting up the base duty cycle table uh, and getting that accurately tuned and then trying to let the closed loop control pick up the pieces and get, uh, get the target uh, right or the boost onto the target. And that can work, but the problem is uh, the, the further out our base duty cycle is, the more error we're going to end up with and the more work the closed loop control strategy has to do to get us onto our target. Exactly the same with cam timing. What we really want to do is spend the time and get our base duty cycle as close to perfect as possible and then that's going to mean that the closed loop control system can do a better job so that's why we've got this workflow get our base duty cycle dialed in first then we'll move on to our proportional integral and de derivative gains so all right our proportional gain we already have a bit of a sense of these numbers here uh, and this does vary from one ecu to another so uh, there isn't sort of a, a fixed number that you can apply to every ecu Base map will give you a bit of an idea, but we're going to see exactly how we can go about this. So what I'm going to do, we'll just get us up and running here on the dyno. Maybe a couple of thousand RPM. Three thousand will do. Okay, so again, we've got no uh, proportional gain at the moment, so we've got no closed loop control. We can see that our target uh, has jumped up to, I think it's about 23 degrees there, and we're sitting with our actual cam timing at zero. So what we're going to do here is start by putting in a value of 0 0.1 for our proportional gain. We see on our graph this really slow lethargic rise up towards our target. So it's kind of doing the job but it's pretty slow and we really want cam control to be quite quick. So what we're going to do is go back across to our cam target map and what we're going to do is first of all start by zeroing the values and we're going to do what's called a step test. So when we're testing any PID control algorithm, and this is actually the easiest element to do with cam control, it's harder to do with idle speed control and it's harder to do with boost control, but we can do such a great job with this uh, test when we're doing cam control. What we want to do is basically step between two values and basically monitor how well the system responds. So let's just try exactly that. I'll just get us back onto our set point on the dyno. So at the moment we've actually cheated a little bit we've gone to zero and zero is generally not a real good place to do our test and we also don't want to do our test at the other extreme of the travel and the reason for this is that zero we obviously can't retard the cam timing beyond it 30 degrees we already know that's the maximum advance so we can't advance beyond that so basically what that's going to do is artificially mask any overshoot that we want or we're going, we're going to get we obviously don't want any overshoot so uh, what I'm going to do in this case we know we've got 30 degrees of travel I'm going to step between 10 and 20 degrees so at the moment we've got a value of 10 degrees in there again I'll just get us back onto our control point so let's just enter the value 20 and we'll press enter and again we see this really sort of slow lethargic rise in our uh, control our, our uh, measured cam angle let's go back to 10 uh, and yeah absolute garbage this is not going to work for cam control that's cool though we're starting somewhere Let's go back to our proportional gain. When we're making these changes, uh, I always recommend at least initially making big changes so you can really see the effect of them. So big changes, let's just start by doubling it. We started with 0.1, let's go to 0.2. We'll come back to our target angle. Uh, again, we're going to do our step test, going to 20 degrees. See, that's much, much faster. Still garbage, but much, much faster than it was. Let's come back down to 10. Again, much faster but absolute garbage okay we're going in the right direction though so what are we going to do of course we're going to double it again 0.4 okay let's come back to our cam target table and i'll just get us back again into our set point seem to be struggling to keep my foot on the throttle for some reason let's try 20 degrees okay 
So we can see that we over we step up, but now we've got this little oscillation in there. So much, much faster response, but it overshoots and then comes back. It overshoots again and then it, it gathers itself up and gets pretty close to our target. Let's step back down the other way. Exactly the same. It's undershooting, then coming back to our target. This is actually pretty good though. This is what we want to see because at the moment, remember this is just like only using the throttle to get to our traffic lights. We're always gonna overshoot without some damping or braking effect, which remember is our derivative. So let's just see what happens when we've really got it gone too far though. We're going to double this again, 0.8. And uh, let's come back to our target. Again, we're gonna do our little step test or get back on the throttle again and 20 degrees. Okay, so now we've lost control. See, it's just oscillating wildly. We've gone too far. So if we see something like this, no problem. Just go back to our last change or maybe in between. So we went from 0.4 to 0.8. Let's go back to 0.4 because it wasn't too bad. It was pretty good. Uh, I reckon we could probably go a little bit further, but we'll see how we can deal with that. Oscillation's gone, great. But we also know, if we come back to our target table again, we know that if we go back to uh, 10 degrees, we've got that undershoot. And if we go back to 20 degrees, we've got that overshoot. Fine. Let's bring in our second element, which is our derivative gain. So we'll go to our derivative gain. And again, we can kind of get a sense of the numbers that Haltech think are going to be suitable for this. Let's start with a value of 0.01. So a little bit less than what's in that base map, but that's okay. Let's see how that works. Okay, we'll do our step test again. <clears throat> back down to 10 degrees. Okay. See, we've got a tiny little undershoot. It was more pronounced on the way up though, so let's try 20 degrees. Okay, still got some overshoot, but less than it was, so it's working. Let's go back to our derivative. Uh, again, we simply start by doubling these numbers. We're not gonna do any damage here. The system mechanically can't be damaged, so no harm in making these big changes. The problem is if we make really small changes, they can be too subtle to really see the effect of that change, and we don't really know if they're having the effect we want. All right, so let's try again our step test 10 degrees. That looks really, really good. Pretty sharp, crisp, and nothing, no real undershoot, but we know that the overshoot was more pronounced pretty good there. I'm reasonably happy with this. Uh, let's just try a little bit more derivative gain. So we're actually going a little bit above and beyond. 0.04 would be doubling it. Don't know if we're going to need to go that far, but let's go back and we'll try again our step test 10. Problem is if we use too much derivative gain, that's going to have the effect of artificially slowing down our response anyway, because remember it is a braking or damping effect. So we do want to be a little bit mindful of that. 20 degrees, Okay, that's actually pretty good. I reckon I'm probably going to split the difference there and go in between. So we'll come back down to our derivative gain. Now understand here that there is no sort of set in stone, this is the number you use. Uh, there could be a variety of different values that are all going to give reasonably good control. It's about you evaluating how crisp that control is and getting something that you're happy with. Uh, let's just go back down to 10 degrees. Yep, pretty happy with that. 20 degrees. Yep, nice and crisp. Okay. Lastly, we can add some integral gain. And again, this just really fixes any remaining error over time. So it should help sort of improve the response if we get it right. Again, we can see the values here that uh, look like uh, they're about right. So let's just start with 0 0.06. Uh, again, we can go to our target table. We'll step back down to 10 degrees. Back up to 20 degrees. Okay. I'm pretty happy with where we're at with that. Uh, if we go too far with any of these uh, elements proportional, we're going to end up with oscillation. Likewise, if we go too far with our integral, oh, let's try and demonstrate that. Uh, let's just go really wild with this and go to a value of 0.5. Uh, we will now do a step test and we should end up with oscillation. A little hard to see, but it's not really controlling as well as it was. So yeah, integral and proportional, we're going to end up with uh, a oscillation. Uh, if we use too much derivative, we're going to end up with very sort of slow lethargic response, like we would get if we're not using too, we're not using enough proportional gain. So what we can do though is basically go backwards and forwards between our proportional and our derivative gains, uh, because once we get to that point where we're just starting to overshoot and oscillate with our proportional gain, we know that we can bring in derivative. We showed that and demonstrated it, and that'll fix that.
that then allows us to go back and maybe try adding a little bit more proportional gain and see if we can get away with a little more proportional and a little bit more derivative it's all about just getting the best response that we can so at this point we've basically got our PID algorithm set up so that we're getting a good crisp fast response so we've now got a system that can actually track our target accurately and give us the the, the results we want so we need to do this before we ever try actually optimizing our cam timing now we can go ahead and do that though and with the cam timing optimizing this uh, there's two separate ways of doing it uh, we can do it under steady state control which is what I'll demonstrate in a second and then we can do ramp runs so basically uh, we're just going to be optimizing the cam timing in the way that the engine is going to be used so steady state what i'm talking about there is holding a fixed rpm on the dyno like we would if we're cruising at sort of two to three thousand rpm on the open road and what we're trying to do is basically optimize the cam timing so that we're making the most torque we can at that combination of load manifold pressure and engine rpm now when we get this right what we're going to see is the torque will increase on the dyno so this is why i say this is something that is difficult arguably impossible to do accurately on the road because we don't get that instantaneous torque feedback the other thing that will come with this though is that as we change the cam timing essentially what that's doing is resulting in a change in volumetric efficiency in the engine in simple terms we're affecting the amount of cylinder fill we're getting or in simpler terms still the amount of oxygen going into the cylinder so when we get the cam timing optimal we've got more oxygen going into the cylinder this is why we can make more torque but a side effect of this is that we're going to find that our air fuel ratio changes so this becomes a bit of an iterative process as we optimize our cam timing we're going to need to go back to our fuel table and we're going to have to uh, add more fuel or subtract more fuel depending on what we're doing with our cam timing so that we stay on our lambda target, our air fuel ratio target. Likewise, while the effect is smaller, uh, the cylinder fill is also going to have an effect on the optimal ignition timing. So it becomes an iterative process of cam timing, then adjusting the fueling and the ignition timing to optimize for that point check our results and then go again so it is a bit of a, a, a slow process but it's very easy to overlook that and end up masking actual cam timing gains because uh, the air fuel ratio might have gone too lean that's actually a good sign believe it or not when the air fuel ratio goes too lean it means that we know we're getting more oxygen entering the cylinder so we need to add more fuel uh, and that's where we're going to make more torque so if we don't monitor the air fuel ratio we can find that because the air fuel ratio has actually moved too lean uh, the torque is either plateaued or maybe fallen away but if we actually took note of the air fuel ratio went back to our fuel main VE table added more efficiency there to add more fuel got our air fuel ratio back on track then we would see the true gain of that cam timing all right let me try and demonstrate that uh, and see if we can get a, a decent result here so what I'm going to do back into our cam target table so what I'll do is I'll just start by zeroing out a big chunk of this table and we'll get back to I think we're about 3000 rpm here so this will require our torque display where we're going to be able to see the torque from our dyno as well uh, as the uh, the cam timing so what we're looking for is that red line on our dyno that's showing the torque that the dyno is measuring and it's always moving around a little bit so there is a bit of an art to kind of reading this basically we want to average the values you could just see it also auto scale so I just put a little bit more throttle in and it's jumped up just looking focusing for a moment on the cam table we've got our little crosshairs that show where we are just like anything that we're optimizing in our tuning we want to make sure that we stay as close as possible to the center of a cell and we may need to readjust that with our throttle pedal position uh, as we make cam timing changes so anyway we're kind of there or thereabouts at the moment uh, 3000 rpm and uh, minus 40 kpa about in the center we can see that we've got about 150 five uh, newton uh, pound foot of torque being displayed I'll just actually get off this and come back into it because the dyno's torque display is doing some weird stuff try and get something a little bit smoother for us okay that's a little bit better okay so what we're going to do is enter a value of 10 degrees 
and look at what our torque does and we also need to make sure again we adjust our throttle as required so we can actually see that our torque jumped up uh, and I'm watching the, the Lambda as well uh, and we've gone a little bit leaner which is exactly what we want. I'll just get back into the centre again, wait for our torque graph to settle down. So going from 0 to 10 we saw a gain uh, and let's go from 10, whoops, let's go from 10, right and now we'll go to 20 and just to make it matters worse that demonstration didn't work because I hadn't pressed enter so let's just go back and try all of that again all right looking at our graph we are now on zero I didn't press enter key mistake there we don't want to do that the change won't actually take effect until we press the enter key so enter a value of 10 we'll press the enter key and now I want to want you to watch that red graph torque graph and we see that our torque graph jumped up a little bit our cam timing actually looks like our PID after all of that did not do a really good job I'll address that later but we are on our 10 degrees now our, our torque has jumped up we'll enter a value of 20 again what we're looking for here is the change after I press enter and our cam time this time actually does a really good job of tracking it and our torque has jumped up a little bit not a massive amount and when we see a small change in our torque, just like we're tuning ignition timing, uh, that generally means that we're pretty close to optimal. Uh, I just put a little bit too much throttle in, which resulted in that jump there. So I'll just get us back. This is why it's so critical to be very sensitive on our throttle, make sure we're in the middle. So uh, also with our Lambda, which I know is off graph at the moment, uh, we started uh, with zero degrees cam timing with a Lambda of 0 0.93, 0 0.94. I'm now up to 0 0.98. So that again shows us that we're going in the right direction. So let's just try our last test here. Again, I'll just get us back in the center here, uh, waiting for our torque graph to sort of settle down. And I'll enter a value of 30. Haven't pressed enter yet. Let's do that now. 30, slight increase nothing really dramatic there uh, I think the number that we actually had in there in the base map was 25 but basically looking at that between uh, 30 degrees and 20 degrees it's a bit of a coin toss lambda hasn't changed either that's sitting at 0.97 so uh, kind of backing up that basically nothing much between uh, sort of 20 and 30 degrees so you know I wouldn't be using cam control to try and uh, sort of chase every last sort of tenth of a, a foot pound of torque. It's, it's not that critical, but you know, we can see changes of uh, two to three foot pound and that is a meaningful result. So we can sort of round these numbers to get where we need to be. The other element with getting good cam control, if we just look purely at our graph, at, uh, our base map at the moment, you can see that if we were coming up through our 60 kPa column here, we've sort of got smooth numbers, 27, 30, 35, 35, 35, 32, 25, 13, 6. It's really important that we have a sensible step in our target that the ECU and the mechanical system can have some hope of tracking. What I mean by this is it's a mechanical system at heart and there is always going to be some latency in the control. So it can't instantly jump from zero degrees to 40 degrees or 30 degrees or whatever. So if we can make it sort of life a little bit easier by smoothing it out and making it step like five degrees instead of 15, we're going to end up with better control. So it's always something that I try and look at and it goes in both directions. So if we look at it here, I mean, obviously I've just, uh, zero or just sort of uh, set this whole block here to fixed values but if we look at something from the let's try and draw somewhere where we can actually see it if we look at uh, horizontally at 5000 rpm here 12 15 17 20 25 25 we've got the same smooth trend so really important to not try and have big steps and uh, and try and sort of chase the exact number because while yes for an individual cell you may show maybe one or two more foot pound of torque uh, the reality is that when we actually drive the car it's going to struggle to track uh, and that's going to mean it's erratic and the important point here is that with a lot of OE vehicles that run continuously variable cam control they'll generally be mass airflow meter based and that's great for them because when the cam timing changes and the airflow into the engine changes, that mass airflow sensor is directly measuring that. With our speed density system here, that's not the case. All we're looking at is a combination of manifold pressure and RPM. 
and the volumetric efficiency for that combination will change depending on our cam timing. So what I'm getting at here is if the cam timing we're actually seeing, what the engine's actually receiving, isn't what our target was, then our fueling and our ignition timing will be out. So really important to make sure uh, that the cam control has the best chance of doing its job. So the process I just showed there, that's what we go through when we're doing steady state tuning. And understandably, there's a lot of cells here, so you could spend a huge amount of time doing this, particularly when I also mentioned that uh, we've only looked at cam timing. There's also the need to potentially go back and revisit our fueling and our ignition timing. Well, the good news is that we don't necessarily need to tune every single cell. For the very reason that I've just said, we've got smooth trends in this table. We could pick out a few key cells. Let's say uh, maybe we want to tune this 4,000 RPM at minus 60. Uh, then we might want to tune the uh, 0 kPa 4,000 RPM. We could just simply interpolate horizontally between those. And you know, obviously the same goes as we move into positive boost. Uh, likewise with RPM, we don't necessarily have to do every 500 RPM. We could do every 1,000 RPM. Obviously, we could just simply reduce the resolution of this table to get the same effect. There's a variety of different ways to skin the proverbial cat in this case. Anyway, that's the process we're going through. With the steady state tuning, I generally do this or focus my energies mostly in the areas that I know the engine's going to spend the most of its time. Uh, so that would be sort of 2,500 to 4,500 RPM and sort of very light throttle cruise up to our transition into boost which might be maybe 20 to 30 kPa of positive pressure. Uh, from there the high RPM and wide open throttle area of the map uh, we're going to do this under ramp run conditions because if we do this under steady state A it's not realistic and B we're also going to end up uh, producing a huge amount of heat and putting a lot of stress on the engine and the turbocharger which just doesn't make any sense. So the process I, I use for this is we'll start by basically zeroing out uh, the entire wide open throttle running area. We can do that. Uh, let's just re reduce this a little bit. Uh, we, we know we're going to go up to about maybe 100 kPa, 15 psi of boost. So we'll start by sending that to zero, press enter. Okay, so now we're going to be running on our most retarded timing. So what we'll do is perform a, a ramp run. And again, we might need to tweak our fueling and our ignition timing to optimize that ramp run for our zero degree timing. Once we're comfortable with that, we've got it optimized, I would save that ramp run so we can refer to it later. Then we'll simply come back into our table, enter a value of 10 degrees, go through the same process. Do some ramp runs, optimize our fueling and our ignition till we've got a, a good result that we're happy with. And we'll go through, do that to 20 degrees and then to 30 degrees. And this is basically going to give us uh, some over, overlapping ramp runs which we can then use to guide us in building up uh, our ideal cam timing map, what I call our composite cam timing. So let's have a look, I'm not going to go through and, and perform those ramp runs but uh, here's one I prepared earlier. So if we jump across to, my, to the dyno screen and uh, what we've got here is, oh, let's get rid of this run for a start. Uh, so I've got the yellow run here is zero degrees, so our most retarded. And what we can see straight away is uh, very, very, very little power at low RPM. Uh, but right up at the top, right up at sort of 7,500 RPM or 7,000 RPM, uh, that looks like it's made the most power, pretty much like I said it would right at the start. It's almost like I've done this before. Then we look at our green run, which is our 10 degrees. So straight away you can see how dramatic that change is through the mid-range. Mid uh, it's kind of splitting hairs. It's made more power here at 6,500 RPM, uh, right at the top of the run there. Um, actually our, yeah, our zero degree has made a, a whopping uh, 0.4 of a horsepower difference which is probably a run to run variation so basically what this means is between zero and 10 degrees is really not much in it. Okay looking at our white run which is our 20 degree uh, we can see again good solid gain in power and torque down low uh, but now we're starting to see that effect of the cam timing being over advanced at high RPM not really optimizing our cylinder fill. We see that right at 7000 RPM our white run we've actually lost uh, you know, five odd horsepower over our maximum run. So obviously we're going the wrong direction here. Uh, finally our purple run, 30 degrees, the maximum mechanical uh, advance that we can get. Uh, another good gain in 
power and torque down low until we get to this point about here 5,500 RPM we can then see the white run which was 20 degrees that kind of overtakes it until we get to this point here 6,200 RPM that point the green run overtakes it so now we can use that data to help us tune or optimize our cam timing map so let's start with our first point so we know from this that we want to be at 30 degrees advance up to five and a half thousand rpm so let's jump back into our laptop screen uh, we know also and i haven't touched on this that we're going to struggle getting good cam control down at very low rpm and that's simply because we don't have enough oil pressure to really good, get good control so generally i might actually start with maybe zero or maybe five degrees at a thousand rpm uh, we're really not interested too much until we get up to sort of two thousand rpm but uh, let's start here uh, 30 degrees let's try 15 and 20 again i'm just trying to get some smooth numbers in here that are going to be actually achievable uh, we'll take that actually back up to 10 to give a nice smooth control all right so we know that our first point is five and a half thousand rpm so let's come up to five and a half thousand rpm so at that point the white run which is 20 degrees that actually made uh, more power so we'll enter that then the next point coming over to our dyno graph again uh, it's about 6,300 RPM uh, is where our 10 degree run starts making more power. Uh, now we don't actually have a 6,300 RPM breakpoint. We can obviously add one if you want to get really fussy, but let's just call that 6,500 for the sake of our demonstration. So uh, we're going to drop that down to 20, uh, 10 degrees. So we want to set these ones to 20, and then we want to set this six and a half thousand rpm to 10 degrees and then we got to that point where we we really didn't see much of a change but i mean you know there was a 0.4 of a horsepower or whatever it was uh at 7000 rpm so now we've got this kind of shape to our graph what we can then do is go and perform a ramp run with our composite mapping uh built out from those individual runs and what we should get if we get it right is uh, a run which is red you can't see it because it's kind of being hidden by the maximum values but basically it should follow uh, the maximum values right through here uh, we actually see there's probably some run to run variation because we've actually made uh, a little bit more power probably heat soak because I did all of these runs quite quickly so uh, basically that's where we should end up now coming back to uh, our, our map here uh, what I do once I've got a composite map done I would also go ahead and bracket these and what I mean by this is this is what the the dyno says should be optimal but let's try advancing them five degrees or ten degrees and then try retarding them five or ten degrees and just see if there's anything more to be had uh, likewise you may find that the changeover points need to be tweaked a little bit maybe just maybe at 5000 rpm would actually benefit from 25 degrees instead of 30 but it's very easy to make these small subtle changes and i mean you're going to already be within the last few percent of uh, what is going to be available anyway so this is really sort of starting to fine tune a lot of it comes down to how much time do you actually want to spend doing this it's really up to the individual and uh, if you're doing it commercially obviously time is money you're going to be charging this out to a customer um, now an element that i haven't talked about uh, yet is um, uh, integral wind up which is a term that you probably uh, haven't heard of if you haven't done any PID tuning and this really comes back to the mechanical limit of the cam control uh, so I'm going to do a demonstration on this after we've had the demonstration we will go into questions and answers this is a really good time to uh, remind you if you've got questions please start putting those in the comments so we already know that this mechanical system can only advance us up to about 30 degrees or 29.6 29.7 was what it actually was so what happens if we start targeting values that the mechanical system can't achieve well what's going to happen is that integral element which remember looks at the error over time what that's going to do is just continually the longer it can't reach its target it's going to increase the duty cycle trying to reach this target that is absolutely impossible no big deal you might think but the problem is that then when we come back to targeting something we can achieve we have to unwind all of that integral element before it's going to track uh, much clearer and simpler to understand if we do a demonstration so of course we're going to do exactly that so let's just get ourselves up and running here 
again we'll go up to about 3000 up here right so what we're going to do here is start by targeting 20 degrees and there's actually some integral wind up element going on there uh, which I'll explain in a second all right so on our graph here we can see that we're really nicely right on top of our target at the moment so let's try 25 degrees which we know we can achieve it jumps up really quickly let's go back down to 20 yep it follows pretty quickly uh, let's try 50 degrees okay so we see our green line step up to 50 uh, if we're looking at our specific number here uh, we can see Oh, there's a bit of interpolation going on 50 degrees is our target and we're banging around there at about 29 and a half degrees and obviously i've been doing this for a while because i've been talking about it so let's go back to something that uh, we can target let's tell, change it to a value of 20. okay our green line's changed our red line has not budged give it a chance it'll get there obviously i was at 50 degree target for quite a long time uh, while i was talking about what was going on there but uh promise you it will happen in time it's going to start dropping back down there we go very slowly it's coming back to its target and you can see how slowly that's dropping down and that's because the integral element when it was trying to hit 50 degrees or whatever i'd put in it couldn't get there so the duty cycle is just slowly but surely incrementing up to the maximum value right now we're back on our target just showing again if we go up to 25 degrees nice quick response uh 15 degrees nice quick response but as soon as we target something outside the realms of what it can actually achieve that integral wind up element is going to really really affect us and affect the performance so uh, with this aspect we are going to be getting integral wind up at each extreme so uh, if we're looking here our cam target is zero at the moment uh, just turn my aircon off uh, and we can see that our cam angle is moving around if we've got our offsets incorrectly set so we're always seeing at the mechanical stop uh, a value of you know 0 0.5 0 0.6 which we've got now we're getting that integral wind up working at this point as well so it's always a good idea to actually make sure that we're targeting something that is just a little bit off the uh, mechanical stop so that we don't ever end up in a situation where we've got that uh, integral wind up occurring so this is going to help us with response and it's always a good idea to test pretty early on in your cam tuning uh, what the mechanical extremes are for advance and retard make sure that you're always staying within them otherwise you're going to end up with lethargic response and then that's going to affect the uh, fueling and the ignition timing because as i mentioned uh, we're going to have a volumetric efficiency that's different to what the ECU is expecting all right let's jump into our questions and answers now if you've got any more please keep them coming uh, we'll see how many of these we can get through that was just a taste of what we put on every week for our HPA gold members our gold members are able to watch these live and ask questions and get answers while we're presenting after the webinars have been hosted live, they're added into our webinar archive where our gold members can re-watch them at their leisure. We've currently got over 240 hours of existing webinar content covering topics on engine building, engine tuning and wiring. This is one of the fastest ways to expand your knowledge on a wide range of topics as well as to stay up to date with the latest tools, trends and techniques in the performance industry. Our Gold members also get access to our private members only forum which is the best place to get fast answers to your specific questions. Gold membership can be purchased for just 19 US dollars per month, however you'll also receive 3 months of free access with the purchase of any of our courses. Click the link in the description to learn more. If you like that video make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.